بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وبعد In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, we begin by uh, invoking blessing and uh, sending peace uh, upon his prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. Uh, this is the Renovatio uh, podcast. Uh, the Renovatio podcast is connected with Renovatio, a publication that is produced by Zaytuna College. Uh, this afternoon, I have the great pleasure of being with the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan, uh, Professor Juan Cole, who I like to call the real J. Cole, uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Juan Cole. And um, we're hoping to have a conversation about one of the great unassailables of our time, the, the, the concept and idea of equality. But before we get into that, Professor Cole, how are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Good, good, Thanks good. Thanks for having me on. No, it's great to have you on. You know, before we um, began the, the podcast, the recording, I was thanking you for broadening my understanding of kind of the historical background and context of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, because I heard you presenting at Elmhurst College, and you were just pointing out the quite intuitive uh, the Prophet was groomed and raised in Banu Hashim, in a sanctuary city, in a city where you know violence was forbidden, even the cutting down of trees was forbidden, and this would have made him a person predisposed to, to, to peace and uh, islah or, uh, uh, you know, amity and uh, treaty building and, and the like. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, uh, it was a great audience there at Elmhurst, and uh, this comes out of my historical study of the conditions under which Islam arose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today, we're, we're we're biting off a uh, you know uh, a different chunk. We're 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 eating a different piece of toast, uh, looking at this idea of equality, right? This idea of equality. Um, you've written an article that will be uh, airing or will be running in Renovatio, uh, the journal, uh, soon. But you take on this idea of equality. Why? What? what you know, what compelled you, or what? You know, what? What motivated you to to look at this idea of equality in the Quran? Well, I I, I wrote that article, and I. I... I know Renovatio doesn't want it to address a very narrow time period. Uh, those articles are supposed to stand uh, for a long time. Uh, but every piece of writing does have an origin uh, in its time. And uh, I wrote it in the uh, aftermath of the summer of uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the George mm -hmm. Floyd killing, uh, when these issues of uh, racial inequality uh, in the United mm -hmm. States were very much uh, on my mind. Uh, and since mm -hmm. I'm writing about the Quran uh, quite a lot these days, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I was reading it through that lens. Uh, and mm -hmm. it is a text, of course, uh, of, of late antiquity, of the, of the seventh century of the Common Era. Uh, but uh, as, as you were saying uh, when we were talking uh, before the show, uh, these issues in how people are treated and issues in uh, equality of treatment uh, uh, have been with humankind since the beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. But one of the things that, you know, I see you pointing to um, you know, in your in your article, and as a spoiler to everyone else out there, I've been able to read the article. Yes, I have. I, I must admit, <laughs> I must admit, and it is in, immensely enjoyable. Um, but one of the things that you you point out in the article, and we won't spoil it for the readership, is that this kind of mythic, almost egalitarianism, where everyone is categorically equal. You really don't see this anywhere in antiquity. Is that correct? Yeah, or today either. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, 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 you know, it's partly a matter of definition. I mean, what kind of equality could be universal? 
And I think the, the best that most human societies can hope for is an equality of law, an equality of, of social treatment, uh, an equality of opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, where one of the things we're concerned about nowadays is, is um, being able to see when inequality becomes systemic, uh, when uh, there are mechanisms that maybe are not very visible. Uh, for creating mm -hmm. and maintaining inequality. Uh, and, you know, different human societies uh, erect structures of inequality and hierarchies on different bases. In the United States, it's race. Uh, but in mm -hmm. India, they have a problem with caste uh, and mm -hmm. to some extent religion. Uh, and in, in mm -hmm. some other societies, religion is very much an issue. Uh, and so what ethnicity is might change from place to place. Uh, but there is a tendency in human societies to have privileged groups and disprivileged groups uh, and uh, to um, fall into practices of inequality. And I think throughout history, uh, there have been people who found this objectionable uh, and who demanded Again, an equality of treatment, an equality under the law, at the very least for people. And I think, you know, the Quran exemplifies that ethos. No, you know, Dr. Sherman Jackson, who for a long time was at the University of Michigan and uh, who's a teacher and mentor of mine. One of the things that he likes to talk about uh, in reference to modern society and, you know, classical society as well, is that society is always comprised of competing regimes of love and love can never really be equal see love can never be you know it's almost like i love all children but asia najashi and makita my children i can't love other children equally They're, those are my children and people um often have you know competing regimes of love when it comes to ethnicity when it comes to certain class loyalties and affiliations, when it comes to uh, you know co-religion shared among you know a group of adherents, etc., and his point is always rather than denying that these things exist, whether try, you know rather than trying to pretend as though oh no 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 it's it's all it's all the same it's all the same, we actually get further as a, as a society when we acknowledge that yes there are competing regimes of love how can we minimize the way that we're affected by those competing regimes of love in terms of our treatment and before the law, right? And, and how can yeah. we make sure that inequality doesn't become systemic? But in terms of that, that, that esprit de corps, that, that added feeling of, you know, loyalty or love or fealty or, you know, feelings of team spirit, if you will, that exists between members of a particular group that self-identify as a group, I think that's always been there and is probably always going to be there. Yeah, I, I, certainly that, uh, you know, there are lots of professors, but uh, there are a few great men and Sherman Jackson is one of those. Uh, mm -hmm. His insights oh. are very valuable. Uh, uh, what I would say is, you know, people who study ethics, uh, some of them uh, have tried to apply uh, the methods of child psychology uh, and uh, structural psychology to ethics. And uh, it's been posited at least that uh, actually getting to the point where you would sacrifice for, for, for your group of love, uh, for the people that, that you love is, is, uh, is a higher form of ethics than being totally self-absorbed. Uh, so, so when, when you, you love your children, you love your family, well, there are some people who don't very much and who would sell them out, for, uh, you know, for, for a small sum. Uh, so that's, that's a higher ethic, uh, to, to mm -hmm. devote yourself to, to your regime of love, but even higher than that, uh, is mm -hmm. to care about the other and mm -hmm. the way human society works. I think it's generally the case that mm -hmm. if the other is not also being cared for and loved and treated well, then that's gonna mm -hmm. rebound. That's, that's going to end up hurting your loved ones. 
Uh, and so Absolutely. you do have, you know, these higher levels of ethics. And I think people like Jesus and Muhammad were trying to appeal to that higher level. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I think you you bring that out, you know, very effectively, um, you know, in your article, this idea that the Quran, you know, posits the other as an opportunity for mutual learning, right? Looking at this uh, verse in oh, yeah. the chamber. Um, right? Oh, humanity, we created you from one male and one female, and we intentionally spread you into nations and tribes so that you would come to know one another. Truly the most ennobled of you in the sight of God are those possessed of the greatest God consciousness and God is knowing and aware. And looking at this is kind of like, well, the other is not simply to be held in contempt. You know, I remember you uh, writing that maybe some of those Zoroastrian priests might find it, uh, 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 you know, fatuous that this bar this barbarian could in any way be equal to a civilized person, but rather the Quran is, is suggesting that no, the other presents an opportunity to learn, and there is a kind of equality in that. Is that is that am I am I grasping that correctly? Oh, you're saying it better than I did. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, the the ancient world in which the Quran was preached. Uh, did have very strong hierarchies in society. Uh, the Greeks had this idea of the barbarian, uh, and they mm -hmm. used it really unashamedly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they, would, they would just openly call people barbarians. Uh, if they the Arabs have the same thing. You know, ajam. Ajam means yeah, one who cannot see. Yeah, that happens in, in, uh, in the Muslim world as well. And, and in Iran, uh, at that time, it was a Zoroastrian society. Uh, uh, the Zoroastrians aren't very numerous anymore, but you have the Parsis in India and some in, mm -hmm. in uh, Yazd in Iran. But at that time, they were uh, the, the backbone of the Sasanian Iranian Empire. And they mm -hmm. uh, saw the world as Iran, which is good, and an Iran, uh, not Iran, <laughs> which, which is very, very inferior and bad. Uh, so... Uh, this verse of the Quran is challenging those ways of thinking. It's saying, as I read it, that, you know, this division be between the, the, the civilized and the cultured uh, who know things and the barbarian uh, from whom you have nothing to learn uh, is, is a mirage. That, in fact, yeah. every people, every ethnic group, every uh, uh, clan, uh, you know, they develop forms of knowledge. Uh, that are special to their ways of life uh, and mm -hmm. from which one can learn. And, you know, you mm -hmm. can see this in the modern world. And I think about that verse. I think about, I had a, a, a friends when I was uh, an undergraduate at Northwestern uh, who uh, had gotten interested in ethnobiology. Uh, and it's mm. a kind of, you know, branch of anthropology, but also it slides into chemistry. And ethnobotanists go to uh, places like uh, uh, the backwoods of Brazil and they get to know uh, native tribes who mm -hmm. have developed um, knowledge of plants in their area and they use the plants for medicinal purposes or, or psychological purposes. And often mm -hmm. these plants are rare elsewhere. And the outside world just doesn't know of their properties. And, and of course, there's a danger. A lot of this knowledge is disappearing. Uh, so they'll, they'll go out and live with these people and learn from them how they use th these uh, plants for, for medicines. And in some instances, uh, pharmaceutical companies have been able to develop new uh, cures for, for diseases from this knowledge of these Brazilian tribes. Well, you know, from the point of view of the conquistadors uh, who went to Brazil from Spain, uh, these are savages. Uh, they, they have nothing mm -hmm. to teach us. Mm -hmm. But what ethnobotany wow. is telling us is that actually they could save your life. 
you know, one of one of my teachers used to say, don't look down on anyone in terms of knowledge, because sometimes you can find in the creek what doesn't exist in the ocean. You know, so this 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 idea that, you know, a man or woman of learning is also a man or woman of uh, great humility. Right. And that 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 sees that hmm, beneficial knowledge can be gleaned from many places. You know, the prophet famously said that, you know, wisdom is the lost found property of the believer. Wherever she finds it, she claims ownership uh, of it. Right. So this idea that, you know, any you know group of people can be denounced as, you know, patently ignorant uh, with nothing to offer. I too think that this is not a Quranic uh, perspective, but you do mention that the Quran does admit uh, differentiation in virtue. People, there's a, there's a hierarchy of virtue, but that's not the same as a hierarchy of ethnicity or social class. There's a hierarchy of virtue and this is affirmed by the Quran. Is that, am I, am I grasping that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Although what, what's really interesting is that the hierarchy of virtue, uh, uh, which is a very good phrase for it, is, uh, it pertains to individuals mm. and not to groups. Wow. There are no unvirtuous groups. Mm. They're individuals. And, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, you know, the, Cor the Quran was preached in a society where uh, kinship relations were very important. Uh, people had clans, yes. they had tribes. You know, in the Middle East, tribe is not a pejorative. I, I, a lot of people complain now in America when you use the word tribe, uh, yes. especially about, you know, Native Americans or, or, or Africans, that it's, it, it can be pejorative. Uh, but in the Middle East, people are proud of, of belonging. They call it an ashira, to belonging to a kinship yes. group. And they do kinship politics on that basis. Uh, oh, and, yes. Uh, and so the, um, the people in, in, in Mecca, apparently, at the time of the prophet, uh, when he warned them uh, that if they don't shape up, if they don't stop their immoral practices, uh, uh, then they're going to meet a, a, a very unpleasant end in the afterlife, uh, mm -hmm. in, in hell. Uh, they appear to have replied, well, I, I can't worry about that too much. My cousin's a really great guy and he's gonna get me in. Wow. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they that, you know, the heaven or hell, you know, the clans would take care of you. If, if, if anybody from the clan got into heaven, that they'd manage to get you in too. And of course, that's the way their society worked. If, if, if there was any prerogative, any perquisite, any good thing that one of them got, then they were expected mm -hmm. to share it around in the clan. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so um, the Quran is strict with them. And it says, mm -hmm. nobody can help you. You're on yeah. your own, guy. It's an you individual. You know, they, it talks about the nafs, which is uh, the, the soul, the psyche, mm -hmm. the individual soul or psyche that makes its bed with regard to mm -hmm. salvation in the Quran, with regard to ethics. So nothing mm -hmm. that anybody else does, according to the Quran, can benefit you in the afterlife. It's, it's on you as an individual. And in the and same this is, way, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was, I was saying that this, this gift, in a sense, of um, individuality, Right, this gift of, of, of a belief in individual responsibility, individual reckoning is something that I think many modern people used to take for granted, although it's become in vogue, especially in academic circles, that we're back to really talking about groups, the privileged and the underprivileged, right? Uh, the, the heteronormative and the non-binary, the, the white, and the uh, person of color. We're, we're, we're back talking about morality and ethics in large group categories. Uh, this is a departure from, to my mind, what made you know, Islamic civilization and what made uh, Western civilization 
uh, unique from from kind of its 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 antique past. That's right. I, I think there there were um, uh, you know movements and uh, religions, uh, I, I, a lot of Hellenic paganism, for instance, which did you know think that by virtue of belonging to the group, you 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 had a higher spiritual status or you you would have a, a better end. Uh, and uh, I think, as you say, both the Gospels and the Quran challenge this uh, uh, this group thing. Uh, and another interesting thing about this verse that, that you quoted uh, what, is that it begins by talking about male and female. And I think it implies that not only did you did human beings diversify into clans and peoples, uh, which developed then valuable knowledge that the others could learn from, uh, but that men had something to learn from women and vice versa. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. that strikes me. I mean, I, I don't think it's an unprecedented point of view in late antiquity, but I don't think it was a very common view in late antiquity sure. that men had much to learn from women. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. but the Quran, I think, uh, does imply that very strongly. Yes, and there's actually a, a statement uh, attributed to the Prophet, An that women are the twin halves you know, of men, kind of affirming the spiritual equality, you know, of men uh, and women, and that they're equal in their value, but distinct in their roles, right? I think, um, you know, we, we tend to, as moderns, there's a conflation of value and roles, right? For us, there's often this idea that equality in value is only achieved through equality in role. And that that notion, I find uh, um, that 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 notion would be out of place in a in a traditional context. Um, but the 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 Quranic perspective is uh, refreshing, you know. In that you know the other is always it, it, there's always a a great opportunity to learn, you know, about the other. You know, something else that I think you know is a we're, we're segueing into it beautifully is that there is this idea in the Quran, and you mentioned this in your uh, you know, beautiful article, that diversity, or even diversity in the created order, diversity is seen as a sign of God's creative power, right? That variety, even in, you know, you know, uh, you know the, the streaks of color that we see on mountain ranges or variety in you know our languages variety in our complexions race is a is a much more recent notion but variety in our skin colors etc this is a sign of god this is not a breakdown in in what god wanted but rather this is what god wanted yeah you know i had long been a little puzzled by those verses in the quran mm. uh, which talked about uh, all the, the the brightly colored mountains or the, the kind of the brightly colored fruit. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, one of those expressionist uh, uh, paintings uh, in, 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 <laughs> Manet, right? in France, Manet with the, with the, with the, uh, the bowl of fruit and it's uh, these uh, bright colors. Right. Or the flowers and, or the clouds, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the Quran says that these are signs of God. And uh, that people should learn from them. And then, as you say, it it's explicitly mentions the diversity of languages and, and complexions uh, of people as signs of God, as, as a positive. And I wanted to think about where is this coming from? Uh, hmm. what, what exactly does it mean? And why, why are they signs of God? And why are they being given this positive valuation? Because that wasn't common. Uh, mm -hmm. That is to say, uh, although, as you correctly say, the ancient world didn't have our ideas about race, for instance. Uh, race mm -hmm. is a constructed category, and it was constructed in our, our, uh, in our own peculiar uh, use of it uh, fairly recently. But they did, I mean, obviously knew, know that, that there were different peoples with different skin colors, and uh, they valued them differently on that basis sometimes. So Galen appears to be what we would 
now call a horrid racist <laughs> and uh, okay. thought that that, uh, that black people uh, didn't have the same capacities as whites and um, uh, or I'm not sure he would have used the word white but as as Greeks in any case uh, and uh, uh, but the Quran is saying that 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 complexion is is a wonderful thing that the diversity of complexions is a wonderful thing and that it's a sign of God so I I wanted to give some thought to why what is the what is the logic here why is that mm -hmm. the case mm -hmm. so um you know in the quran there's an emphasis on god's role as a differentiator mm -hmm. and there's this uh this sort of notion that i think you see it also in genesis in the bible that in the beginning things were formless mm -hmm. In the beginning, mm -hmm. things were formless and they were uh, without uh, form or color. They were dull mm -hmm. and they weren't distinct. Mm -hmm. uh, which incidentally, uh, you know, scientists now think that uh, the universe developed from a singularity, sort of a black hole. And, and one of the characteristics mm -hmm. of a black hole is that it it, it, no light can escape it. It has no attributes. Uh, the physicists say there's no, no hair on a on a black hole. Uh, so, uh, uh, our contemporary uh, cosmogony is not so different from uh, the ancient one. That that things began by being formless and colorless and dull, and how did they get form and color? That's God's creative activity. God endows mm. them with with form, he differentiates them. And so mm -hmm. in ancient Near East myth, uh, for instance, there was uh, in Mesopotamia and ancient Iraq, uh, there was a notion that um, there was just one body of water and mm -hmm. uh, the divine separated it out into sweet water and salt water. And mm -hmm. it's then surrounded, and then it was separated out from earth. So then you get the three basic elements of human life, sweet water, earth, and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, salt water. Well, this idea is in the Quran, it, this imagery is used, that, that God separated out the two bodies of water and made a barrier yep. between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one is sweet and one is salt, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and one you can drink and the other you can't, and, the, the, and, and then the, the water has pearls in it and so forth. So this differentiation of primal matter into mm -hmm. discrete things, into things that are distinct from one another uh, and which have attributes. That, that's when, wherever you see that, wherever you see difference, that's a sign of God's creativity in the Quran. Yes. And so, so when we see that people have different complexions, why is that a sign of God? That's because they would have different complexions unless uh, they had differentiated from the formless void of the beginning. And so mm -hmm. it is a sign that God's at work here. Uh, yes. And of course, to the extent in our, in our modern way of thinking, you know, um, uh, we now know that s different skin colors are adaptations to, uh, to, to, to nature. Um, uh, I won't go on a lot, a lot about this, but a lot of people don't seem to know this, and it and it, it, it it's fairly well established in the in the science that, you know, human beings need uh, um, uh, vitamin D. Uh, yes. And they and and they don't make it unless they're exposed to sunlight. Sunlight is a trigger for making it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so if you live in an area with um, low UV rays, so that you're you're not being provoked to make vitamin D. You have vitamin D deficiencies, and uh, uh, there are diseases that come about because of that. Uh, uh, multiple sclerosis is associated with low vitamin D, and and so it's more common in Scotland or uh, uh, the Nordic countries uh, because they don't get as much sunlight. Uh, so so you need the vitamin D. That's one of the parameters. The other thing is that you need. Um, uh, you need to protection from ultraviolet rays. Uh, so when an em when a, a mother is pregnant, an embryo in her belly, if it gets too much UV rays, uh, that can do <laughs> genetic damage. It can cause a miscarriage, and maybe not very often. Maybe one in 
you know, several hundred thousand. But over <laughs> time, in uh, in in um, uh, in Central Africa, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. the ultraviolet rays are very heavy. They would uh, select for the darker sisters' babies to survive. So over time, people would be dark skinned in a high UV environment. Uh, but if you took those people and put them in Sweden, uh, they'd have a problem of not being able to get enough U, uh, UV rays to provoke them to make enough vitamin D, which would also be bad for the children. And so in Sweden, over thousands of years, nature would select out the lighter daughter uh, and, and her children uh, for survival. And so that, and that's what really happened in history is that Africans after the ice age was over came up to the Nordic countries and after 13,000 years, they're white. But none of this has anything to do with character or intelligence or, or anything like that. All these things have been hung on it. It's, it's just these two parameters, vitamin D and UV rays. And I'm no, that's a, that's a, yeah, but, that's yeah. actually a very beautiful way of explaining what the Islamic theologians uh, um, associate with the name of God, Musawwir. God is the one who alladhi yusawwirukum fil arhami kayfa yasha. It's God who forms you in the wombs of your mothers, however he chooses. So again, this creativity is seen as an expression of the mashia, of kind of the divine will. Yes. And those blessed with insight can, can, can perceive it as such. And perhaps more importantly, are not frustrated by difference. You know, you're in the Midwest, I'm in the Midwest. So for us, you know, the, the, the line of poetry, uh, it is better to appreciate the change in seasons than to fall hopelessly in love with summer. That makes sense to us. Now for Bay Area people, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it resonates the same way. <laughs> I don't think it resonates. I don't think it resonates the same way. I think that's right. Uh, 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 the, the, there is this great diversity of, of human condition of, of the nature in which we live, and it shapes people. Uh, I personally think I'm not originally from Michigan, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, cold winters and long winters uh, uh, make people a little bit more standoffish, uh, and. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, 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 my son grew up in Michigan, and uh, I'd be with him, and I'd be in a coffee shop or something, and I'd have something on my mind. I, I'd start talking to the person next to me. I'd, I'd ask them a question, and he would say, "Dad, Dad, you're not supposed to talk to strangers like that." <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you know what, what's interesting about your perspective, Professor Cole, is that Ibn Khaldun in his Muqaddima, he says exactly the same thing that the biggest determinant of character. For him, is weather. Oh, that yeah. the closer you get to the Mediterranean, the the more balanced, you know, in his own idiom, the more balanced people become. And the further, or in this case, farther you move from the Mediterranean, the more extreme people become. Right, both extremely north and extremely south. With him using the term himaji, like barbaric, as you get yeah, away yeah. from calming weather of the Mediterranean. So it's it's very, your, your perspective has been shared by other great thinkers, you know. Really quick, I, before, you know, before, yeah. before, before closing though, you know, one of the things that I found most compelling uh, about this, this, this beautiful article you penned is you, you're thinking, I mean, you, you make it very clear that, you know, it was the context of Black Lives Matter and, uh, you know, the, the police killing of George Floyd and, you know, a modern context in which, you know, uh, a friend of mine, Professor Rodrigo Edim, who is now at Georgetown, you know, he said, the early challenges uh, that the Muslim community faced, they were mostly about la ilaha illallah. You know, challenges, you know, it was, you know, uh, Aristotelian logic, it was Hellenistic wisdom and thought, and it was, you know, a lot of issues of Godhead and divinity and epistemology, etc. But the challenges that the community faces uh, now are mostly about the Muhammad Rasulullah, issues of human rights, 
issues of gender equality, issues of uh, alternative sexual identities, gender identities, et cetera. And one of the things I find compelling about this, this article that you wrote was that you know, you, you, you're, you're unafraid to say, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the context we're living in, but I'm looking at the classics. I'm looking at you know, works of late antiquity. I'm looking at the Quran. I'm looking at um, you know, some of the classics in terms of some of the Greek classics. I'm looking at you know, uh, works of the, the playwright Terence. I'm looking at, and these things inform your perspective about the modern world. At Renovatio, this is, this is, for us, this is like, yes, the past has a great deal to say about the present. But I think many people believe that, you know, as we negotiate, you know, race and equality and egalitarianism and some of these modern categories, we're doing all of this ex nihilo. We're the first people that have ever thought about these things. And the, the 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 solutions that we're developing to problems are completely without precedent and i think i think i think you have a lot to say to the contrary oh yeah well you know one of the fascinating things about the time of the prophet muhammad was that was the way that blackness was being used uh and mm. again not not racially but the skin color uh because mm. the ethiopians had conquered yemen uh, mm -hmm. And Yemen had been uh, ruled by, we think, a Jewish dynasty uh, mm -hmm. in the 400s, uh, 500s. But in the early 500s, the Ethiopians came over and conquered it. And they were Christian. They were uh, monophysite Christians like the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, then in 570 or so, around the time the Prophet Muhammad was born, the That's Iranians right. came in and conquered Yemen. Mm -hmm. And they persecuted the Ethiopian Christians uh, mm. and allied with whatever Jews were left and pagans, uh, and they promoted Zoroastrianism. Uh, but according to the uh, uh, accounts of the great uh, Muslim historian Tabari, who was himself from an Iranian background, uh, they, the, the Zoroastrian Iranians who conquered Yemen in the time of the prophet uh, uh, associated Christianity and blackness and they mm -hmm. saw both as signs of loyalty to the Christian Roman Empire in Constantinople. And wow. since that was their enemy, they hunted down and persecuted uh, black people in, in Yemen. Uh, at, and they associated with Christianity, with, uh, with loyalty to Rome, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with loyalty to Ethiopia. And uh, so, and also, then the pagan Arabs uh, had uh, sometimes black slaves from Africa and, and would uh, have children with them. Uh, and the children uh, would have a lower status uh, because they were mixed race. Uh, according to, you know, these uh, early uh, pagan Arab poems. And so uh, Antar was a great warrior uh, who, uh, whose mother was African uh, and who faced discrimination. He couldn't marry the, the woman that he was in love with uh, and his tribe didn't value him until there was a great battle and uh, they, they, they were so desperate they called on his help and he came in and won the battle. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he used to say that uh, uh, he had two lineages. He had the noble lineage of the Arabs and he had the the lineage of the sword, and uh, he yes. substituted the sword for his blackness. Uh, and so when the Quran says uh, that differences of complexion are signs of God and to be valued, it's pushing back against ideologies of blackness uh, that, mm. that de 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 devalued it or, or even actively uh, saw it as, uh, as, as, as a challenge in his own world. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that, that, that notion of the Quran challenging um, this, this, this negative predisposition that existed toward blackness in the Arabian Peninsula, many modern writers have written about that. Um, but one of the things that I, I find compelling is that 
Many of the stories of the Quran and also characters mentioned in the Quran are characters of African origin. So, sure, sure absolutely. Well, man, I, yeah. Moses, yeah. Suleiman, you know, Solomon, Moses. Um, there's almost uh, kind of a tacit. Um, I won't. I, I think it would be an overstatement to call it a celebration, but there's a tacit kind of um, esteem of that, that that Christian past and some of that Africanity that we also see in some of these Quranic stories. Yeah, the, the, in, insofar as the Quran defends uh, Arabian Christianity, uh, it, it seems to me inevitable that it's defending Black Christianity uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, quite deliberately so in, in the face of these critiques of it. Uh, and of course, there are stories that the um, uh, the Ethiopian king, uh, the in, in Axum, uh, the Nijas, uh, gave Muslims uh, refuge when they were being persecuted. Uh, so mm -hmm. th there seems to have been a kind of Muslim, Christian, Arab, Black alliance uh, at at that mm -hmm. time, uh, probably yeah, yeah against the the Arab pagans and perhaps the Sasanian Iranians. You know, my 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 son is actually uh, named Najashi. You know, yeah. after yeah, after yeah. that that, that uh, the title of Ashama ibn Abjar, that that uh, that Aksumite uh, king. Um, but no, this this is a very interesting uh, history. This has been a really enriching conversation. Uh, forgive me if I cut you off in some 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 spaces, um, but I would have been content to just let you talk about this beautiful article that you've written. I am uh, excited that our readership will get to enjoy the article uh, soon. Um, you know, you, you do a very good job of talking about equality in the Quran. And then you end, and I'll let you, I'll let you close us out here, by saying, although there is no direct overlap in terms of modern liberal notions of equality and egalitarianism, you do see um, the Quran challenging some of these, uh, some of the, these hierarchies, right, of gender, some of these hierarchies of complexion, some of these, these even ableist hierarchies. I mean, you know, you talked about uh, Abdullah, you know, Ibn Umm Maktoum, uh, an, may God be pleased with him, um, this, this blind, and also, you know, you bring out Ibn Umm Maktoum, that he didn't have a patronym. He wasn't, he wasn't connected to, you know, a male progenitor, which was a sign of just how socially insignificant he was in that, in that, in that milieu. Uh, and his interaction with the prophet and, you know, the prophet being chided or there, there's a kind of tobich, there's a kind of rebuke that is issued to the prophet. And yeah, I'll let you close by, 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 by highlighting just, you know, kind of, what ended up being the, the, the finishing touch of, of your article. Bismillah, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, well, this is a, a, a wonderful story in the Quran. Uh, and uh, it, it, from reading the Quran, it seems as though uh, the prophet was meeting with some of these pagan notables in Mecca. And he was mm -hmm. eager to see if he couldn't win them over to his cause. Uh, and they were rich and uh, apparently very snotty and, and obnoxious uh, and, uh, uh, and they believed in many gods and they, they resisted his preaching of the one God. And uh, Ibn Umm Maktoub appears to have, uh, the Quran doesn't mention his name, but we, we know it from later sources. Uh, he appears to have approached the Quran during one of these sessions with these notables uh, and, and the prophet didn't have the time for him at that moment. He, he was talking to somebody important. And mm -hmm. th th this is a, a really interesting uh, kind of feature of the Quran and of, of uh, early Islam compared to Christianity, whereas the Prophet Muhammad is very human and he occasionally makes a mistake. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, so the Prophet is, as you say, he's, he's scolded by the Quran that why didn't you have time for um, Ibn Umm Maktoum? Here's this guy who was a seeker. 
is a spiritual seeker, you maybe could win him over. You could have his his belief mm -hmm. in Islam. And you didn't have time for him because you were talking to the hoity-toity guys who you're never going to get their loyalty anyway. They're just right. never going to uh, to uh, be humble enough to acquiesce. Uh, so he, uh, uh, later on, Ibn um Maktoum becomes a caller to prayer. Uh, he's one of the first in, in Medina. Uh, and, and he is one over. And, and so, uh, you know, clearly the Quran is saying uh, that Blind people have souls that are just as valuable, not only just mm -hmm. as valuable as, as any other human being, but just as valuable as the sighted elite, as the wealthy mm -hmm. and the powerful and the, the, the cool mm -hmm. people that you would really like to get to know and be in their circle and maybe they'll, they'll do mm -hmm. some favors for you. But the blind and, and, and the people without known fathers in society are spiritually just as important as they are and it would wow. be wrong it would be wrong to to ignore them in favor of the others wow you know just closing out that that reminds me of this idea that nietzsche really disliked about christianity that he called the transvaluation of human values you see whereas we're naturally inclined to esteem strength and capacity, and right, the ubermanch, this is, we're naturally inclined. He said, Christianity wants us to look at the poor, the weak, the downtrodden, and wants us to kind of see in them our, 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 our exemplary models. And he thought that this was something bad. Religious communities have always esteemed that as, yes, these, these, these are, uh, people whose lives, whose experiences, and whose souls are incalculably, incalculably uh, valuable. And I think that story uh, highlights that. So that, that perhaps is a good place to, to end. This has been uh, a learning experience for me. Um, I look forward to reading your book about the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, uh, a prophet of peace amid uh, a clash of civilizations. If, did I get of the title empires. correct? Of, uh, uh, of empires. Of empires. The clash of empires. Yes. I, I look. For, I look forward to reading that text, and I look forward to um, uh, your, your reading your article again in Renovatio, actually between two proper covers. And uh, this is um, uh, uh, hopefully the first raindrop in what will be a, a, a torrential downpour of of good between you and Renovatio, you and Zaytuna, and me and you, God willing. Well, right. thank, you, thank you so much, uh, Obedallah. I've really enjoyed our conversation, and I've learned from your insights uh, things that I didn't think about in my own article. So I, I, I very much appreciate that. No, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this, this was the, the Renovatio podcast, and uh, we look forward to uh, you, know, uh, you all tuning in uh, for the next episode. Thank you. Mm -hmm.